You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We were off air for a whole month. I hope that you missed us just as much as we missed you. We're really glad to be back on air now. In this week's program, we'll be interviewing Matt uh, Delante, the host of the Atheist Experience. We'll also be talking about the refugee crisis in Europe as well as the murder of Bangladeshi bloggers and the drying up of rivers in Iran, amongst other things. Stay with us. Religious beliefs can be harmful. At best, it can hinder your potential and your social relations. At worst, it can cause murder and mayhem. It prevents you from finding the truth and living life to its fullest. Religious beliefs can be very harmful and I think, uh, in fact, when you look at uh, these beliefs, they're not just beliefs that stand on their own, they translate into, you know, your relationships with people, into how you perceive yourself even, and so, you know, something very simple as women's position in a society vis-à-vis uh, -vis a religious belief, how, what that translates into is very harmful to yourself to your you know your uh, the women in your family from your wife to daughters and so on and so forth to the larger society now i agree and i think part and parcel of being human is to be critical of your environment your belief yourself your your friend relationship everything that that's what makes us um, human and uh, being critical with no limit no limit absolutely no limit you know just to the end uh, to be able to um, you know, unfold an issue, you know, to extreme, you know, that's the challenge, that, that's the beauty of uh, being human and that's where, you know, that, that's what makes us human, that's where people actually progressed um, um, historically and I think on, on daily um, living as well. When it comes to religious belief, um, it seems that we, we are a bit more careful nowadays, uh, that we say, okay, we don't want any public space, but on private, let it be. And I think that's the area we need to challenge because that's, once we accept this as private sphere means no criticism, criticism and no dialogue around religion, that's what becomes, I think, stale and ossified. Yeah, and also when we say that people have a right to their religious beliefs in the private space, that often seems to mean that therefore it's a no-go area, you know, and we often focus on the public space. Well, religion has to be kept separate, so on and so forth. But it's important to look at these beliefs in and of themselves and how harmful they are, um, you know. And there are so many examples of this, you know, we, we um, from 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 young people who harm themselves because they feel guilty because they've masturbated or because, uh, you know, they've uh, had some uh, thoughts about. A, the girl next door. Do you know what I mean? It's it all translates into real mental and physical anguish, and so it is clearly harmful. It's not just I believe in something and that's the end of it. I agree, and I think the different aspect of this uh, part of it is, for example, health, the, uh, believing in hell or believing the um, afterlife. I think that uh, truncates your life in a way, uh, it, the meaning of your life today and changes your life and makes your um, um, daily life in a, a, a very distorted in a way and you don't actually um, use your full potential this is what we have uh, and the beauty of life is to make it good. Yeah, definitely. And we, we're here talking more about private beliefs and relationships, but of course we're seeing what these beliefs can translate into on a global mass scale, like with the religious right and so on and so forth. Now we've got an interview with Matt Delanti and he talks about this and explains this really beautifully. Stay with us and listen to this interview. Hi Matt, welcome to the program. I Thank wanted you. to talk to you about um, religion and whether, you know, when it's a personal matter, is there still any harm to it? I think so. I'm, I mean, I'm an advocate of people being free to live as their conscience dictates. 
And I, I'm a huge supporter of free speech and freedom of religion. I, don't, I think it's kind of absurd to try to, to legislate what can be in someone's mind. But I do care about what people believe as individuals because I, I'm, I'm convinced that what you believe uh, informs your actions. You know, it, the fact that two people believe in God doesn't tell you necessarily what they're going to do, but it does mean that if this isn't true, there's some model in their head that has convinced them that this is a good thing to believe, and that model might be used to believe other things. It, it's, it's kind of the, if you, if you have flawed reasoning in one area, even if that specific belief doesn't cause a great deal of harm, the reasoning behind it could then be used for other beliefs that cause harm. So I, I care about what people believe individually. I'd love to live in a world where everybody behaved, you know, perfectly rationally, which doesn't make us robots. I mean, we still have emotions. Uh, we still care about people when we do things. Um, but it, it just seems to me that, you know, I've said before, I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. And that's because what I believe informs my actions and my actions have consequences for myself and others because we don't live in isolation. So while your beliefs may be isolated and, oh, it's just, you know, grandmother or a friend or whatever, and they, they just believe this, I'm not running around trying to take those beliefs away. I, and certainly never by force, I want people to give them up for good reasons so they can live a better life. But some people will say that religion is um, really good for them. It helps them lead moral lives. Um, it's not harmful at all. I, you know, I've heard this a lot, and I understand it, because if you, from my perspective, religions were sort of, uh, invented, not necessarily intentionally, maybe, you know, more organically, uh, we, because we have discomforts with not knowing things. We have discomforts with death and you know, mortality. And so trying to provide answers and comfort there is one of the ways that these things have begun to thrive, these, these religions. So it doesn't surprise me that people find comfort there. I, I think it's, it'd be enormously comforting to think that, you know, death is not the end, that I'm going to get reunited with someone. But I have no good reason to think that it's true. And as long as that's the case, it may in fact be harmful. This, this, this thing of we're really bad about assessing what is good for us. You know, I'm, I'm diabetic and it's probably brought on by the way I ate. Um, I probably poisoned my own pancreas. At each point along that step, oh, this piece of dessert or this Coca-Cola or whatever, uh, it, it felt good for me, it brought me happiness. But the long-term effects may be very different. And I wouldn't, you know, like if my grandmother was uh, in the process of dying, I'm not going to go in there and try to say, no, grandma, there's no heaven. I don't want to take that away from her. Um, but long before that, the, the peace that people get, the comfort that they get, I think is somewhat of an illusion that it's, it's perhaps like a pacifier in some sense, at least until it's demonstrated to be true. And I don't think that mere comfort or short-term comfort, especially if it may sacrifice you know, long-term or big uh, gains, is really worthy. And I think one of the problems with death in particular is that we've kind of trained people to look at it in a certain way. All religions have. And so if instead we were to teach people that death is a real part of life, that we're all going to die, then maybe we'd spend more time treating people right the first time, trying to mend fences, uh, rather than, you know, oh, I, I hated that person their entire life, but now they're gone and I feel bad about it, but I'll get to make it up to them in heaven. I, I don't see how that's that much value. I understand that people find comfort in it, but people also find comfort in alcohol and drugs, which they're not always harmful. I had a drink, you've had a drink, somebody, it's not a big deal, but it can become a problem. Do you find, though, in especially with death, you know, explaining that there's nothing after, isn't that quite painful? Well, my take is I have no idea what happens when I'm dead. Uh, so far as I can tell, I'm dead. It's the end. It's nothing. And I think the most common response to that that I get from people is, oh, well, that all of life just became meaningless and worthless. You know, it has no value because you're going to die. And I won't say that it's bizarre. I mean, I understand how they get to that point, but I, I can't think like that. I've, I've tried to consider that, and it just doesn't make any sense to me because um, I have a car right now. Eventually, that car is going to end up in a junkyard. It's going to be of no use to anyone, but it has value right now, immense value. I can drive people places. It gets me to work. You know, 
Uh, to, to say that life has no value because it ends is to me almost backwards. It's like saying, oh, I really shouldn't, you know, this, this meal that I just ate was a waste of time because I'm just going to have to eat again tomorrow. It has value while it's, life is its own reward. It's the living that is the value. And when you say, for example, if you lived forever, how much value does a hundred years have? Virtually none. The entirety of my life, the entirety of human existence, everything I've known about in life becomes relatively valueless, meaningless in the grand scheme of eternity. But if that hundred years is all I get, then every moment is that much more precious. What do you say to people who say, well, you know, better to at least believe because there's a chance of going to heaven. And if there is no heaven, then they haven't lost anything. Yeah. So first of all, this idea that you haven't lost anything, I think is wrong. Um, every false belief you accept prevents you from finding the truth. Now, it may be the case we never find that the truth about some things, but we're certainly not if we think we already have the answer. So what you're giving up in this version of Pascal's Wager, I did an entire like 30 minute video going through what Blaise Pascal said and what different people said, but this idea of, oh, it's better to believe. Well, okay, which one do you believe? Do you pick, do you pick the one with the best heaven and believe that? Do you try to avoid the one with the worst hell? What if you don't know which of them to believe? What if there's a God who is not encapsulated in any religious tradition and whose real goal is to reward people who aren't seduced and gullible enough to fall for this safe bet. I mean, it's as if, could you fool a God? Well, as people say, it's better for you to act as if you believe. Really? Do you think you can fool a God? Is there some God who's going to say, well, I know you didn't really believe, but you acted like you believed. <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, I don't think my spouse would be too happy if I, if I pretended to be faithful, you know, if she, if she knew otherwise. So every, at every turn with this, this various versions of Pascal's Wager, there's some failing. It's not no cost. You're sacrificing the pursuit of truth. You're sacrificing. Plus, religions are not just a, oh, you believe and you're done. They come with instructions and consequences quite often. You know, I, I had a completely different view of homosexuality and abortion and women's rights the entire time that I was a believer. So I can't say that there weren't any consequences. It's not just, I believe in God and now we're done. Nothing else comes from this, because once you adopt a particular religion, the one you're trying to get into that paradise or avoid, you know, that damnation, there's baggage that comes along with that. There's baggage that results in subjugating women or in many cases, killing infidels, killing people who aren't like us, creating divisive barriers. So to pretend that there's no cost to religious belief, the people who say that I think are the ones who aren't really very serious about religion. They really have looked at this as if you know, I'd probably be better off if I believed just in case. And I don't even think they've thought about the fact that I don't think you're really going to fool a God. Well, what, what do you say to people who say, um, then what's it all about if um, there isn't a God and there is no heaven? Yeah, what's it all about? It's about whatever you want it to be about. I mean, if you, could, you could get very reductionist and go down, to, you know, a la Richard Dawkins to talk about uh, the gene that it being the important thing, that we, we are not important, that it's about genes trying to propagate themselves. And that's fine. I, I think there's beauty in that. I think there's uh, beauty in just looking at the world, around the world, and even if it began as a series of accidents that were built into the, you know, the structures that natural law basically dictated. Uh, but I get to decide what my life's going to be about. That's amazing. I, I'd lecture at universities. And one of the things that I do is I'll, I'll bring in some examples of changes, you know, like putting in God we trust on American currency uh, and replacing our old motto. And they're not aware of the, that this has changed just in the last 50, 60 years. And I ask them repeatedly, you're here at a university. Did you pick your own major? Would you have been happy if your parents picked your major for you? How about if the government decided what your job would be? How about if the school advisor picked your major? Oh, no, 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 you're going to be part of this program. You might want to be a doctor, but we're going to send you down the sociologist path. We would object. We object to this external imposition of meaning, purpose, guidance in every context. If the government gets too overbearing, violating our, our desire to be free and be the masters of our own ships, we revolt. 
Why is it somehow a good thing when there's a God out there with a plan and God's plan is for you to be this and God gives your life meaning and purpose? In every other scenario, we would object and revolt and somehow religions man manage to convince people, oh, this is a good thing. And by the way, it's not just a good thing. You need to have this because without this, your life is valueless. No, it's not. I, I get... My, my meaning, my purpose, my value, it's self-directed, but it's also in cooperation with other people. Uh, I'm not meaningless to myself, and I'm certainly not meaningless to the people that care about me and the people that I care about. Thank you. Three thousand Syrian refugees are trying to enter the EU every single day. It is the result of, you know, uh, war and ISIS and everything else that you can think of in in that country. And you know, people are trying to get to safety to get some protection for themselves, and they're being met with tear gas and batons and wire fences and just, you know, a fortress. And I think nothing. Like the footage that we see on um, screen of um, uh, our TV um, on daily basis that people from um, Syria and other refugees from different countries are trying to cross uh, into Macedonia. Um, these are decent people actually when you see uh, mothers with the children and, and, and people trying to save the families from the horrible situation they're leaving behind and they've been projected as criminals. I think one of the things is that we're seeing is, as you say, this criminalization of people who are seeking, uh, you know, protection, refuge, asylum, and they're being, you know, they're, they're often discussed in very sort of criminal terms. But the reality is that if you condemn what's happening in Syria, then would you have to have an answer for people who are trying to flee that situation. And the reality is that we are facing a new situation, that if, uh, um, uh, people are moving around, uh, in the same way that you can't control capital movements uh, anywhere, uh, free, you know, capital is free to move anywhere, exploit anywhere, and move the production with instant. But when it comes to people, you have, we, have, we have a different policy. I think that's something that we need to recognize. It's a new thing. We need to deal with it differently. We can't use the old system, but it's human beings, and I think borders should be, should be removed. Definitely. And when you think about the fact that these are people in need, you know, and the numbers coming into Europe are really the tip of the iceberg. I mean, a lot of countries bordering in the south, bordering these um, areas with war and with Islamism and U.S. militarism, they're the ones who've taken the brunt of the populations who are fleeing. Iran, for example, has two million refugees, and the Pakistan, you know, uh, many countries, Turkey, they're inundated with refugees. So not only must we support refugees in other countries, but we also have to open borders up for people here. It's a right. It's like saying people need to go to the hospital and we shut down the hospital. It's a human right that people who want protection should be able to get it. Imagine in medieval times that people were tied to the land and little sort of areas and the fact that people, the right to have freedom of movement was a fundamental right that people achieved and managed to get. That's the fundamental we need to come back again and say, oh, people have the right have the right to move freely anywhere they want. Borders should be removed. Definitely. And something Faribors had said earlier is that, you know, these people who are fleeing are the best of the best. They're people who haven't joined ISIS and joined, you know, the Syrian dictatorship or the Iranian regime. They are people who have refused to accept those conditions. They want to live like human beings. These are the best people that you know, borders should be open for. You can't have it both ways. You, if you're going to oppose ISIS in Syria, you have to open the borders for those fleeing ISIS. It's, it's, a, win, it's a no brainer. The good news this week is, of course, the wonderful protests in Iraq, in Baghdad, and many other cities, including in Iraqi Kurdistan, where people have come out, half a million in Baghdad uh, alone, uh, demanding basic civil rights and also demanding secularism. One of the most brilliant slogans ever, historically and from today, I declare, is one of, one of the best slogans was, neither Sunni nor Shia but secularism. That's, that's beautiful. And that's what we've been arguing in this program for, for a year at least, uh, um, to say that the people in Middle East, actually, uh, the secular movement is very strong. 
people want this, but the institution, organized religion, military states and corrupt religious governments, they pretend that this is sort of, you know, they, they, they have everything and people, this is what people want. People don't want religious government and that's, they've, they've said this beautifully in Iraq. And they've been very clear about the fact that, you know, many of the slogans talks about the religious government and how it needs to go, how it's corrupt, how it's, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, basically, it's one of the slogans was ripping people off. Absolutely, the um, the demonstration started about water and electricity in Baghdad. The fact that there's no decent water, water and electricity, 24 hours a day. There's so many. It's just frustrating in that country. It started with this, and it was linked very clearly to the corrupt religious groups who divided up the state and the resources between themselves. And that's why it started. But people immediately recognized they don't want division between Shia and Sunni and different religious groups. They want civilization, they want secularism, and that's beautiful to see. Yeah, definitely. And I think this is really when, when you know, people ask, well, what, what can we do to help? What can we do to make a difference? Well, that is your movement, really, you know, those people in Iraq uh, who are fighting for secularism, who don't want, um, you know, um, a, a religious theocracy in society. And I think it's important to both raise their voices outside of Iraq, but also to support them wholeheartedly. Since February of this year, four Bangladeshi bloggers have been murdered by Islamists off a death list of 80 plus people. And what we're seeing is that People are being threatened that they're going to be next. More people are being added onto the list. Um, and uh, we're seeing inaction, in essence, from the Bangladeshi government. And not only inaction, but you have someone like the inspector to police saying that, it, basically blaming the victims rather than uh, holding the Islamists accountable. It seems that uh, uh, the Bangladeshi government somehow is colluding with the Islamists because while they under pressure, They've arrested two people. They're trying to sort of uh, um, coy the rest of the society and stop criticism of religion, saying, look, if you, want, you don't want this to continue, stop criticizing religion. I think that's what they're doing. Well, reality is that the protest is actually forced the government, Bangladeshi government, who is responsible to safeguard the life and, uh, and security of the bloggers and free speech in Bangladesh. Uh, the protest has actually forced the Bangladeshi government to, to act I mean, this needs to continue. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's other things as well. For example, we need to get Bangladeshi bloggers, the 80 plus people, there's 15 at risk right now, out of the country. So governments should be giving them visas. There are humanitarian visas that they can get, um, other sorts of visas that they can get to get out of the country. And I think there is some work being done, including by organizations I'm working with, on getting some people out. I, I think that's key. But most importantly, it's putting pressure on the Bangladeshi government to say that this is unacceptable. It's and, unacceptable. And the campaign that this program actually been um, supporting and will support is a spreading. We need to support Bangladeshi activists and free thinkers uh, um, abroad and in Bangladesh and uh, outside of Bangladesh and, and strengthen that, that support as much as possible and, uh, and, and force the um, Bangladeshi government to uh, create a secure, a secure environment for uh, free thinkers to be able to criticize and work in, in Bangladesh. I mean, Bangladesh has a very, very strong and long history of secularism. And this is, you know, one of the Islamists' attempt to push back secularism and bring a, a form of theocracy in that country. And so what uh, is being done to the Bangladeshi bloggers is part of that larger movement to do that. And it's important for us to defend people, of course, that's our primary concern, but also to demand that you know, um, secularism and that the secular characteristic of Bangladesh um, remains and becomes stronger and, and is strengthened because it is a plus for, for, that, for that region as a whole as well. A sheikh from Al-Azhar in Egypt has written to Ayatollah Shirazi in Qom, Iran, you know, Iran's holy place, saying that they should come together to sign 
a sort of fatwa of Muslim unity to stop Muslim bloodshed. So they're basically, first of all, only interested Muslims. in Muslims being killed. And second of all, all of those Muslims that they are killing from ISIS to the Iranian regime to, you know, um, talk about the Saudi government, all of them, they're not considered Muslims anyway. And they want a scientific conference on this. Yes. Why bloodshed, stopping bloodshed in this scientific conference? Stop doing it. Just you know, that, stop that, killing. That, exactly. I think the, the thing is that is interesting. I think scientific. It's very, very interesting. <laughs> I think they, they, they're trying to sort of create an anti-ISIS alliance. But interestingly, Mokaram Shirazi, who's the one side of this debate, yeah. he can't go to Cairo. Because the situation, because Iranian government and the Egyptian government don't have a formal relationship, to, they won't allow them to go in there. And also, I, think, <laughs> I, I mean, this is interesting. Sort out the diplomatic relation first. Uh, the other thing is that I think they're worried about themselves because it's only because they're worried about themselves. Seriously, that's because since when do they care about bloodshed? They live for bloodshed. Actually. I think that's what they do. I mean, look at all the people that they kill in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in all these Islamic ridden countries. What about those people? Mm. It doesn't need a scientific conference. I it? think uh, you can forget about your scientific conference. Um, and, you know, I mean, really, the, just the whole, the whole idea of just stopping Muslim bloodshed. There are other people in the world, you know, other than Muslims. And a lot of the Muslims that you don't like consider themselves Muslim. So. Now, for our slice of life, we've got this wonderful photo and also a very tragic photo, really, of a young activist woman, a, you know, environmental activist, who is protesting the drying of Urumia Lake. Um, and it's, it was the largest salt lake in the world, and it was phenomenal. I remember that lake when I was young. We went there a couple of times as a family when we went to uh, Azerbaijan um, and um, it, it was beautiful. It, you, you could actually lie on the, on, on, on the water and you wouldn't sink because of the uh, density of the, uh, the salt, level of salt in, in water. And, and the other thing is that the mud around, uh, it was very therapeutic and it was used for, my grandmother always asked for a bit of that mud for us to take for her and it was actually good for um, yeah, it has therapeutic and medi uh, uh, medicinal sort of benefits um, um, for pains, pain relief. But the uh, the, the, the birds over uh, around that lake, they were, they were beautiful. You know, the migration of the birds, you could see amazing um, um, wild birds there. And that's not there anymore. That is completely gone. Tragedy. It's interesting to find out why this has happened in Iran from, you know, to one of the most beautiful wildlife scene. We hope you enjoyed this week's program and we look forward to hearing from you and hopefully seeing you next week again at the same time and same place. Goodbye from me and Mariam. Yep, see you then. Bye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. 
You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.